Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, when I'm in Hong Kong, I always feel I'm too Western to be Chinese and too Chinese to be Western. And Professor, uh, Professor Yu Yohan, Master Yu Yohan, is the godfather of political pop. And Professor Gladstone, among many of his titles, he also edits a journal of contemporary Chinese art. And Professor Glaston, um, I'm wondering um, if you could, in a nutshell, describe Professor Yu and his style and his position in art history or cultural history. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I guess that depends on whose history we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a single definitive history, particularly of the kind of work that we're talking about in China since the 19 late 1970s. Um, certainly from an international point of view, uh, Yu's work is important because it's amongst some of the first works of contemporary Chinese art that were recognized by an international public. He's one of the progenitors of political pop and has created iconic images which are still recognizable as being representative of contemporary Chinese art. But before that, he was a groundbreaking painter, as we can see from some of the images behind us. In the 1970s, he made um, uh, painterly works that were influenced by post-impressionism that were groundbreaking within China at the time. And also, he was one of the early, earliest people to develop a signature abstract style in China. So he has a significance before that, which he's recognized for within a Western context. But I think beyond that, he's just a really good painter. Uh, you know, he's a, a very sensitive, thoughtful maker of paintings, and he's been able to negotiate the, the possibility of painting through changing times. I mean, he's been working as, you know, as a mature painter since the 1970s, and his style has changed, often radically, and in a circular fashion. Certainly the abstracts he made in the 1980s, he's kind of gone back to that style more recently as a way of negotiating the possibility of a vital felt painting through very, very turbulent times, not only in China, but internationally over the past 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. We'll come back to the uh, question of circularity in terms of history, which I found uh, profoundly fascinating. Um, I would like to ask, uh, uh, Master Yu, uh, Yu uh, Just now, Professor Glaston mentioned that uh, your important position in art history and culture history. So, I would like to discuss your personal style and especially um, your return to your previous style. Uh, I would like to ask you, from your perspective, how do you want to be seen in art history? How would you position yourself in art history? I think this is too early to tell. Art history is history. And an individual, or say an artist, the hist history's verdict on, verdict on an individual artist will have to wait, um, for example, another five or 10 years. It's, it's entirely possible. And art, uh, I don't mind how art history says about me. I just go with the flow. Professor Gladstone recently just published a book about Johan. So I think you could tell us what you know, struck you, you know, with the idea of writing a book, and then how did this all start? Yeah. I suppose the beginnings of the book go back quite a long way. Mm -hmm. uh, the first conversation that you and I had was, I think, back in 2007, which has been published in various places. And we had conversations after that mm -hmm. about, about his work. The idea of a book, I think, arose maybe about six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so the whole making of the book has taken a long time. Uh, which is not a bad thing, you know, it's, it takes time to do the research on the work and also get a feeling for the work and what one wants to say. You also have to have the material, sort of propitious material conditions. The right publisher, you know, we found a fantastic publisher in 3030 Press 
and John Millichap, uh, also working with Shang Art, the gallery, every, and, and Master Yu himself. He, he had to be happy that we were doing the book because he played a major part in, in the making of the book, mm -hmm. which is uh, rare. It's difficult to do that. So we had the right conditions to make the book. Um, there are very few, really, if any, significant, serious scholarly monographs on contemporary Chinese artists, which may seem like a kind of surprising thing to say mm -hmm. because there's so much writing about contemporary Chinese art. But so much of that art exists in a, in, in a kind of more popular context. So writing a kind of serious, theorized, well-researched, beautifully produced book is not necessarily a straightforward thing to do. So we just found ourselves with the right conditions to do so. And I think the time has come, in the general sense, to produce this kind of work. Um, you know, I think it's a good time to start producing these kind of more substantial written works on contemporary Chinese art. And I think in the case of this work, we have an artist who has had a long painterly life. Uh, it's been very varied. Uh, the painting responds to uh, a wide range of changing circumstances internationally in, in China. So there was really something to write about. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a story to write about. There's a, a, a biographical narrative. And, and the, the need to theorize or think through historically what the relationship of this painting is to those changing circumstances that I've been talked about. So with some artists, it may be a little bit early to do that, but certainly not with this work. There's something rich and varied to talk about. Yeah, uh, it's very uh, true that until a few years ago that we usually see the monograph about contemporary Chinese art lumping Chinese artists together as a group. And now we start to see uh, uh, you know, individual pieces about individual artists for their own merits. Uh, uh, when Professor Gladstone was writing this book, and he mentioned that as a Western scholar uh, visiting, paying a visit, uh, eminent Chinese artists, the different kinds of cultural um, references and historical views. So when you were collaborating on this particular book, and was there a, a, a situation uh, wherein you have to reconcile with each other because he's a Western scholar and you have to really explain to him uh, what you understand of the position of culture? Um, sure. I think what you, uh, the issues you were referring to, it's, it's not very um, obvious there. Professor Gladstone, uh, he teaches in China, and he's been teaching in China for many, many years. And his, acu his, his theoretical acumen and his grasp of the Chinese reality um, is very, very thorough. So, of course, they were purely coincidental situations that he came to our studio, uh, Shang Art, and I came to see my work, and he developed an interest in me. And then in uh, 2007, uh, he came to my, to my house and uh, interviewed me. I think for at least two days, Lots of well-researched, prepared questions, lots of uh, detailed questions were asked. So because of this, I think this entire process of making this, this book, it was not a, I don't think there was any uh, obstacle or conflict in there. I think I was very happy with the whole process. Uh, was the book making process creating any surprise to you in terms of surprise, surprised uh, by the, any discovery about his works or his lives that you didn't learn about until the book? Uh, well, for sure. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, when one goes into the kind of detail and the kind of rigor that we went into for this book, mm -hmm. uh, one is always revealing detail, mm -hmm. uh, telling detail about the relationship between the work and the artist's life 
and also um, the historical context within the work take within which the work takes place. And I think it's it's that kind of detail which throws up kind of new insights into how one might interpret mm -hmm. the work. So the process of researching and writing the book, of course, is always a kind of discovery. Mm -hmm. I think for everyone, really. I mean, even for the even for the artist, you know, they have to go back through their archives. They have to reflect on. Uh, their work as a result of questioning. So it's a kind of revelatory process for everyone. And of course, when one's writing the book, you, you, one's not in absolute control of the meaning. You know, I, I go back and I've kind of had to relook at the book for various reasons. And of course, new possibilities grow out of that uh, because you start to see connections that weren't there before. And I think one last thing to say is, it, although it was a you know, it's a kind of relatively easy process in one sense. You know, everybody was very committed to doing the book. It's, it is a critical book. And it's not there simply to, simply to celebrate the work, although it does that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a search and critical analysis. And so uh, it wasn't simply a matter of kind of telling a story and kind of saying, you know, kind of universally positive things about the work or the context. It was a searching question about what, you know, how was the work made? what its meanings were meant to be, how it related to the historical context. And I think for a lot of readers, I think the, the, the book may throw up mm -hmm. a kind of much more complex relationship between the work and its times than has previously been discussed mm -hmm. in other writings about Yu's work. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, can we start to look at his early work uh, immediately around after the uh, Cultural Revolution in the 70s, well, you know, he was known for post-impressionist style. Was he uh, interactive with the other artists in Shanghai, or he's pretty much on his own? He was pretty much on his own. Uh, that's an in interesting question. I think I think we need to put post-impressionism in inverted commas. I think it's a kind of convenient title because clearly the works were made uh, in a way that was influenced by. Uh, what we call post-impressionist work within a European and an American context. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that using that title kind of suggests a slightly negative reading, that they're, they're kind of copies or derivative. And that's not the case. I mean, it's an intersection, as I think is the case throughout Yu's work. There's an intersection between, if you like, a westernized painterly tradition, modernist tradition, and also, um, a, you know, various cultural traditions in the Chinese context or the Asian context. And what's new about that is, is the particular interaction that takes place within the particular history mm -hmm. of the making of these paintings. Remembering, of course, that many of the works that we're talking about in the Western context were also influenced or intersected with influences from Asia. You know, it's one of the kind of hidden histories of Western modernism that a great deal of Western modernist art was, was strongly impacted upon mm -hmm. by thinking and practice from East Asia. So we've got a, a two-way street, a complex two-way street going on here. I think the thing about those early works from the 1970s is, is in many ways, they're hugely radical. You know, they're, they're, not, the, they're not the kind of works that were being necessarily supported by official culture in China at the time. And it may seem surprising that it was possible to paint um, some of those paintings as early as 1973 in China, uh, where socialist realism was still, in theory at least, dominant. Mm -hmm. They don't conform to the, the political edicts of the time. They're conforming to the desire of a, a single artist to paint in a particular way, in a way that he felt was appropriate to painting and that he thought was sustainable. In, within that context, which is going against that, the grain of that political context at the mm -hmm. time. So they're very important works in that sense. I don't think Yu's ever been a kind of loner. I mean, he was a teacher for many, many years and taught some very significant artists, younger artists who've contributed to contemporary Chinese art. So he's always been connected, particularly within the Shanghai milieu. Um, he may be able to tell us differently, but I, d I don't think he was ever kind of a person who wanted to be in a group. Mm -hmm. I think it's always been about interacting with other people, but going your own way, mm -hmm. finding your own voice. And although there, were, there have been lots of artists as part of contemporary Chinese art who've done that, of course, the 1980s is very famous for, you know, groups of artists and people working together in China, mm -hmm. you know, protective 
groups and interactive groups. In many ways, uh, you was, was not doing that. I mean, he participated in group exhibitions and this kind of thing. But this has been about a kind of an individual reflective effort on what might count as painting right now. Mm -hmm. And what counted as painting yesterday isn't necessarily going to count today. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if we need to change, we've got to change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an individual consideration about what needs to change. But also, obviously, reflecting on the conditions of society. The shift towards political pop, for example, uh, was very much a response to changing, very quickly, radically changing circumstances in China during the late 1980s. In, he was in the his, uh, his, uh, Shanghai Museum of um, Historical Art and the Boston uh, Art Museum was an exhibition of um, painters. So I, I, I just want to draw upon uh, Gladstone's book. So, so you basically saw Western art for the first time, like Kandinsky by Kalindsky or Mondrian. Uh, were you extremely excited about it when you first saw them? Did you mean the Boston um, Art Museum exhibition in Shanghai Art Shanghai Museum? Both are actually museums, not art museums. So there were there was an exhibition on tour, on loan. Sorry lots of uh, the abstract art, contemporary abstract Amer art of America. Uh, I think that quite a few, well, a dozen painters, almost 20 uh, names were represented. Uh, I just watched, uh, I, I saw all of them very, very slowly. Some works I have seen or have read about in uh, other venues, such as in a range of things as calendars or books or journals, etc., etc. So overall, I was I was extremely excited because that was such a such a big collection of various artists and and the original works really, really. Uh, were quite impressive. I was extremely happy. But on the other hand, I wouldn't want to exaggerate to say that I was extremely, extremely excited. I'm kind of not easily excitable. I never really find myself in a highly excited state, but I was just happy, quite happy. And and just juggle between all these, um, seeing all these works. And I think, and it did exert an impact on me. And I was extremely grateful to that uh, exhibition. And so, Master Yu, I also believe that you also emphasize the independence of the artist and not in the service of politics. So, in 1985, your, you first exhibited your ex abstract art, and in Chinese society of that time, especially the art community, what was their reaction towards um, your art? Because the abstract uh, art does not have a uh, a very specific symbolism. Now, it is also an indirect political language, and many people would emphasize on this. And, and it has a lot to do uh, with the political uh, tension. Now, what are the responses that you had received? I think this is a rather complicated thing to talk about. I think for art to t entirely you know, do away with politics, this is um, something that doesn't stand, I would think. And I don't entirely agree with this. I think art and politics, uh, as well as uh, every day's life, is uh, interrelated. For example, I have uh, painted some Mao's uh, work. I think, as you know, in, an ordinary citizen, um, you know the well because Mao has been a very central figure in the soci societal development in this 
age um, in China. Therefore, I have, um, uh, you know, uh, Mao has appeared in multiple times in my work. Now, as a citizen, you know, if you uh, stand at an appropriate, you know, historic height and look at certain historical events and circumstances and you represent it, then you must be able to stand the test of history. It must hold water going down the road. I think uh, whatever my uh, position or my value in is in uh, history, that is really not important. And let's say 50 or 100 and maybe 200 years down the road, um, my view or my dis my illustration or description, you know, of a certain political event, you know, what uh, impact does it have on the history? You know, I this is something I think important, and I simply put, I don't like to make any mistakes as far as this is concerned. Now, your series of uh, Mao work, you know, has uh, comes with various styles, and they are representation of our, of your styles. Now, we are curious to know that uh, what are your views on Andy Warhol's uh, Mao pictures and his work, Andy Warhol's picture, um, does it have an influence on you? And how do you develop your own unique style out of his? Uh, Andy Warhol's Mao uh, paintings, uh, I think you got some out there, I saw it. And I had seen it previously too. Uh, perhaps it's, uh, the, the color actually can be changed. And uh, the slides are like, um, it's, it's playing very f quickly. Well, my, my work is different from his, I mean Andy's. His is more decorative, uh, to be put in a sitting room uh, with a big frame. Uh, you know, there's a, a red one with a green background or, you know, th or effects of that sort. It's actually quite uh, pretty. However, my style uh, wasn't along this line. I didn't do it only for, um, you know, for the beauty of it. You know, there's this one with uh, Mao and Whitney Houston. To me, this is a way of Mao appreciating uh, Winnie Houston's. So my work put them together uh, with the emphasizing on the impression expressions. What I'm saying is that with the opening and reform of China, this You know, this piece of work of mine is mainly to describe that. You know, actually, I had painted two or three uh, versions of this. Uh, Mao with a, you know, little girl or with another, ve another very famous personality. You know, f this is something that I did to, memor uh, to commemorate, uh, commemorate the opening and reform of uh, mainland China. What do you think about Mao's um De depiction of Mao in Andy Warhol's art versus uh, Master Yu. Um, I think the uh, one first noticed that um, there's almost a feminization started with Andy, Andy Warhol in terms of coloring, the color. And in Yu's works, you also see a lot of um, so far uh, feminine symbols like flowers, etc., and vibrant colors. What do you see these two sort of paradigms in two different uh, cultural positions? Um, I'm not sure about the feminization, I'll I take your point, but mm. um, I, think, I think one of the things that perhaps links you and Warhol is to echo the point that you just made, which is that it, it's impossible really to dislocate artistic production, the making mm -hmm. of art from politics. Mm -hmm. It exists within a political milieu. I think one of the key things to think about is not only that Andy Warhol and you are coming at the making of 
visual images from differing specialist contexts. Mm -hmm. So Master Yu is, is in part coming at his work in relation to a Chinese tradition mm -hmm. of which Warhol was most certainly, you know, just didn't know much about that. It wasn't part of his milieu. Warhol's coming out of, of uh, an American modernist uh, situation. Both of them uh, are engaging with politics and painting but within different context, but overlapping context. So Warhol's decision to make silk screens and paintings of Mao in part is influenced by the impact of uh, Maoism on Western culture, mm -hmm. particularly during the 1960s and 70s, where the Cultural Revolution was something that was enormously important as part of the background to the, the counterculture in America. So if we situate Warhol's paintings as part of postmodernism, uh, that, that work which develops arguably from the early 1960s or maybe a little bit earlier onwards as a, um, an art which is self-consciously engaged with popular culture and media culture and wider political culture rather than necessarily trying to turn on, in on itself um, like the abstract work before that, which wasn't successful in turning away from the world, uh, we should say. But in any case, that kind of American postmodernism, which is politically engaged, is engaging with a particular westernized or American sensibility about events. And so Mao appears in Warhol's work in relation to that, that situation. Of course, you and his contemporaries have a different view. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you lived through the Cultural Revolution. He was a student in Beijing during the Cultural Revolution. He had a direct, you know, kind of lived experience, which Warhol just did not have. And so, although the paintings, you know, the Mao paintings, um, which uh, you has produced, do have a reference towards not just Andy Warhol, but other pop artists um, as well, um, uh, they also speak to a particular localized experience of what Mao's significance and image means. Mm -hmm. And I think he's absolutely right. There's a, there's a kind of decorative quality in Warhol which is very commensurate with thinking and practices around American postmodernism, which doesn't appear in this work. Although there's an overlap, there's a connection between the two. And I think the last thing to say really is that because there is this connection, inalienable connection between artistic production and politics, that we have to see use work both as a kind of an inward looking attempt to think about and make work which is vital as painting within that particular moment from the point of view of an artist and a maker, but also thinking outwardly about how to negotiate the possibility of painting in relation to particular political, a particular political situation. And of course, those Mao paintings and, uh, have been made after Mao, after the death of Mao. So they partly negotiate that position in retrospect, as well as in relation to the immediate political circumstances in China and internationally at the time when they were made. Mm -hmm. Master Yu, I think uh, after modernism, just like Picasso, uh, uh, you know, there has been some uh, forking out, you know, uh, of the career of uh, various artists. For example, uh, Picasso has a blue period and a pink period. Each comes with a very different style. However, if we look at the Art Basel, uh, if you look at, um, you know, uh, several places in Hong Kong, you, they, you can find uh, your work. Uh, for example, in Basai, in Art Basel, there is one work uh, called, of yours called Zhan Zhuang in 2015. Uh, it is about a realistic person uh, standing on top of a roof, a roof eve. Then at Art Central, there is another piece uh, that was done in this year. Uh, about the life of Mao, and if you go to uh, the C co collection at M plus, uh, there's just one on what that you did in one uh, 1999 about uh, Chairman Mao chatting with the peasants in uh, Liaoshan. So this is from 1994 to 2012. Uh, you know, a, a series of abstract works that you did too, uh, that you can find that too in Hong Kong. So your uh, works are so um, 
um, uh, multifaceted. So you you're not troubled uh, of going back to your original style. So, what are your views about your changing styles? All in all, there's been when there are big changes in the Chinese uh, society, I would change the style, the content, and the direction of my work. First of all, you know the first change would be the Cultural Revolution. I recall at that time, I have not painted uh, Mao. I only remembered uh, that I was um, painting about the great criticism. Uh, criticism. At that time, I was at the central, uh, the um, porcelain uh, department of the Central Academy of Art. This division is a very, very small one. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, as you may be aware, uh, all classes were stopped in order for the revolution to flourish. At that time, my health wasn't exactly uh, that good. I had uh, hepatitis. And then I also became a student at Tiananmen Square, actually opposite to it. There's one on the left, there's another one on the right, a very huge slogan made of cement. And the width is somewhat like this. At least uh, two-thirds of the length in here. We painted uh, Chairman Mao and Lin Bell standing there in front of Tiananmen Square. And Mao was uh, lying, and Lin Bell is there uh, taking uh, with him a little red book. It, at school, uh, we took an entire you know, piece of acrylic to you know, paint one row after another. Uh, I recall that I was uh, given you know, the task of um, painting um, a portrait of Chairman Mao. I can't remember whether I participated in that drawing of Lin Biao himself, but I do recall that there were 50 or so uh, pa pieces of paper uh, that were arranged into 11 strings or, or 11 banners. Uh, we found a, a very long letter and a large, uh, um, you know, um, bottle or uh, bucket of glue, and then we put that on uh, tricycles. And from uh, Donghuan uh, Third Ring Road, where our school was, and rode all the way to Tiananmen Square, where the slogan was, and then we put out the letter, and then. Uh, did it, you know, bit by bit. Each of these uh, 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 the slogans, I mean the banners, uh, we put in uh, the glue and then the painting. And in the end, uh, we have Lin Biao and Chairman Mao. So during the Cultural Revolution, I had felt the impact of it, and then I did not participate in any more of such activities. After the Cultural Revolution, especially after uh, Chairman Mao died, uh, passed away, and Deng Xiaoping uh, got into power, the country slowly moved into uh, the route of opening a reform. Therefore, I started to draw abstract paintings and other you know, Mao themes, you know, the ones that I talked about just now. And that's because uh, the country has changed. And what I paint would also change in the end. There was this um, a period where uh, Deng Xiaoping went south and gave his uh, speech. I cannot recall which year.
but definitely there was this period. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, went to Shenzhen and he said, good, this road is the right one, the direction is the right one. Then the entire China developed uh, like what, you know, in the way that Shenzhen did. Meaning that people would go for money, go for economic uh, development. Uh, the same was uh, for Shanghai. And uh, what I especially dislike was that, you know, a very good um, wall uh, lined with trees, I think, which was uh, very elegant. However, it was taken down and, you know, houses were built along it and, you know, and leasing to this and that person. You know, in the end, it was all very chaotic. And the Sinhua bookstore, uh, you know, didn't sell any valuable books anymore. You know, they were, you know, selling cardigans or, you know, clothing. You know, all of these stores, you know, had to open and had to reform and had to make uh, a lot of money, you know, very quickly. You know, at that time, I felt... I recall that I went to the Yimeng Mountain, and it is exactly under this kind of uh, of a context or a background that I went there. You know, Shanghai. You know, uh, you know, has you know, there's been a lot of houses built there. You know, I call them empty boxes. You know, these houses. I think if the inner uh, side of a person is already emptied out, and you know, and they only had space for money. So I felt very discontent. I felt very unhappy. So I went to uh, Nimeng Mountain. There's no longer any young people there. Only the elderly were left behind, as well as the very young. I think, you know, they remain uh, very simple people. And, you know, their work tools, as well as, you know, the, the, the houses, you know, remain very much the same as the, you know, Hang Dynasty. There's no uh, modern machineries, etc. So I made some drawings or paintings about Nimong Mountain. Nimong Mountain is unlike Mount Everest, it's not that very high. However, the stone, the rock was very, you know, very uh, harsh. Uh, it has However, it has very big boulders, and and you know next to the boulders, uh, there was a lot of uh, fields of uh, potatoes and peanuts, and you know to me, you know this is more like a, a quiet place, and emotionally, I am more attached to these uh, peasant lifestyle, so I draw, I drew a lot of uh, work on this too. So my style actually changes with the different changes in the society in China. And there are several pieces that... The painting by Van Hoch uh, of someone eating potato, and Chairman Mao was also eating potatoes there. So basically, my work is kind of... My, just how do I characterize my work? Foreign artists, they are also um, uniting to, uh, to each contribute um, portrait of Mao. In the uh, 90s, I think Mao portraiture, I stopped doing that, I think, because some uh, Shanghainese, uh, some uh, somebody from the Shanghai leadership told me that I had better stop uh, cut it out. I said, okay, sure, I'll do. And then I real after a few years, I mean, during the Cultural Revolution, I think there was a very famous slogan. Um, uh, people from across the world love Chairman Mao. I love this, totally. And it's, it furnishes an excellent um, theme for my uh, work. So I just, um, I tried to a lot of artists like Cezanne, like Picasso, like uh, Van Gogh. Uh, I kind of mobilized all of them in their styles, you know, and tried to to give them my uh, interpretation. So I kind of stand in uh, for them and paint a Chema Mao. So I did about 30 of them, 30 uh, international artists, 
and it took me all together uh, 30 uh, male portraits. So in the style of you know these international artists. Um, so simply put, it's a foreign chairman so, uh, out. Mr. Yu just talked about his ability to mobilize mm -hmm. the Western mm -hmm. masters to recast Mao. Mm -hmm. And I want to mm -hmm. give you the time uh, to take one or two questions for uh, Mr. Yu and the Professor Gaston. Please. Speak loud. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about the um, paintings from the 1970s. Uh, where were they exhibited? Where were they showed in public? And who saw those? It wasn't for sale, and basically they were not exhibited. <laughs> So in the 1970s, um, 1980s, uh, I did very few uh, works because there was no gallery and there were no, no, there was nowhere to exhibit. So there were no collector. There was nothing basically. So when I had time, actually, I would just paint to to please myself, so to speak. The first time we will be seeing these paintings. Or were they shown later at some point? Yeah. I think it was such the first time on such a scale that my works were, you know, presented. And it was also containing a lot of text. So P Professor Gladstone, because he interviewed me and he actually spent quite a lot of time focusing on my work, so he actually wrote very rich material. Um, there was a um, there was an exhibition, a kind of uh, retrospective exhibition of Yu's work in Beijing in. Was it 2013 or 14, which included a range of these works? I think, I think the different styles have been shown individually in different places, but maybe, maybe that retrospective in Beijing was the first time that the works have been shown together in it physically. And I know there's an upcoming show of uh, used work which is showing up a reasonably wide range of the styles, which is coming up in Shanghai shortly. So, although it's not exactly the first time, I think certainly the book is the first publication to put everything together in a publication. Yeah, if you speak fast enough, I can take the second question and we'll wrap it up. Anyone? Okay, I will just uh, observe that because uh, we are at an art fair and I did some research. Although uh, Master Yu is usually associated with you know, the political pop, but to my surprise, the uh, two works that have been uh, in auction markets commanding the highest sales price were actually his abstract paintings. So it's very interesting, and I think it, it shows that uh, in the in the market uh, that people re uh, collectors really recognize the versatile styles and the value of his different you know, uh, undertakings. And I think it's fascinating. And I also, uh, thanks to um, Professor uh, Glaston, that uh, Master Yi rarely uh, gave any uh, public uh, speech or interviews. So this is a, a, you know, a treat for all of us. And thank you. Thank you. And I hope you will rush out and to go and buy a, a catalog. Where can we get the book, <laughs> by the way? In the bookshop. OK. <laughs> <laughs> or from 3030 Press online if you can't get one here. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you.